And today we're looking at Daniel chapter 4. And this is the last time for now that we will encounter King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Uh, soon his time will be over and there'll be a new king on the block, so to speak. But today we find out what happens to King Nebuchadnezzar. He's been on something of a journey that we discover through the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 1, he has subdued Jerusalem. He takes away the best of the best back to Babylon. And he encounters those of the Jewish faith that he now has uh, within his uh, empire and in his midst in his royal court. And he's impressed by them. To these four young men, that's Daniel and his three friends, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. So he now has those of the Jewish faith in his midst, and he's impressed by them. Then in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, a dream of a big statue. He's the golden bit at the top. He quite likes this, but it all comes crashing down. Uh, due to it having feet of clay and a rock not hewn by human hands. Uh, but that rock remains. It's an everlasting kingdom. Daniel interprets a dream. No one else could, but Daniel does. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar is impressed by this. So in, in Daniel chapter 2, we read, King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. And the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. So Nebuchadnezzar is definitely on something of a journey, falling down. Surely your God is the God of all gods, he says. But as we thought before, he's saying your God. It's not yet his God. He's offering gifts to Daniel, not offering worship to the Lord. But he's definitely on some kind of a journey. Then in Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar sets up an image of gold, really as a homage to himself. It's to be worshipped by everyone on pain of being burned to death in a furnace. So although he's on some kind of a, a journey, I think it's safe to say he's not quite there yet, uh, threatening to burn people to death if they don't fall down before a golden statue. His pride and his hubris is obviously still there, and that really is going to have to be dealt with uh, one way or another. Well, Daniel's three friends, they're, they're thrown into the fire, but then Nebuchadnezzar says, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods, he said. He went on to say, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. And then he appoints them uh, as uh, and promoted them as administrators in the province of Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar, in a way, certainly recognizes God in the myriad of all of the idols and trinkets and statues and everything else that's, that's going on there in the midst of all the kind of false idols that are put in mantle pieces but have to be nailed down to stop them leaning over or, or toppling over. In the midst of all that kind of thing, Nebuchadnezzar does seem to recognize who God is and the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He again says praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's, again, it's their God, but he does seem to recognize that he is a living God. 
but he doesn't yet know God for himself. He knows him to be real, but God isn't yet real to him. And so Nebuchadnezzar has no real peace within. No matter how great he is, no matter how materially rich he is, and he was fabulously wealthy, no matter how powerful he is in human terms, for all of his great achievements, which were many, he has no peace within. I remember seeing a sign that said, no God, no peace, as an N-O, no God, no peace, but no God, K-N-O-W, and no peace. We're told that the peace of God transcends all understanding. Do not be anxious about anything it says in Philippians 4, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The God of peace will be with you, it says there in that chapter in the New Testament. But Nebuchadnezzar, he doesn't yet know that peace because he doesn't yet know God for himself. And unfortunately for Nebuchadnezzar. It's tragic to read, but Nebuchadnezzar goes through some sort of breakdown. Uh, and it's, it's all laid out there, and it, it's quite harrowing to read. We would never want to see that in a person, but that effectively is what happened to him. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, he evidently has no peace inside him for all of the things that he has in life. And he goes through uh, some kind of breakdown and unusually for a king of that era it's recorded I mean he does come out the other side of it we should say that thankfully and he comes out stronger and he comes out healthier but him going through that and entering into that it's painful reading Daniel himself you can tell is quite upset by it and he tries to help Nebuchadnezzar he sees the signs there and he speaks to him about it. But Nebuchadnezzar goes through this very painful time for him. And so Daniel chapter 4, it's really like, although it's an official record, it's almost like a personal journal entry by Nebuchadnezzar. He writes it all down. It's in the first person. This is what happened to me, he says. And so Daniel chapter 4, in that sense, is actually pretty much unique in the Bible and the way it's written and what it describes. But like many other parts of Daniel, it begins with a dream. And so Daniel chapter 4 begins uh, this way. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar, that's the person who's writing it, just as in the ancient times, a letter by Paul would begin Paul, or a letter by Peter would begin Peter. This begins Nebuchadnezzar, which means this is, this is me writing this down. To the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. It's my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. So he's now saying, for me, something's changed within him. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. It's amazing what he writes. Then he tells us about the dream. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. So all seemed well on a surface level in a material sense. Palace, prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. We've been there before with Nebuchadnezzar. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream, interpret it for me, he says. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. 
Under it, the beasts of the field found shelter, and the birds of the air lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in my bed, I looked, and there before me was a messenger or a watchman, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He called out in a loud voice, Cut down the tree, trim off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit, let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but let the, the stump and its roots, bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you, he says. So he has a dream. He's at home. He's in his palace prosperous and powerful and then the dream comes and it's the dream of this tree in the middle of the land everyone can see it it grew large and strong the top reached to the sky beautiful leaves abundant fruit shade underneath for the beasts of the field birds in the branches everyone's fed by it i mean you can quite obviously tell it's him and his empire reading it it seems seems fairly obvious where where this is going about it being depicted it's an image of Nebuchadnezzar, with everyone able to see him and how great and powerful it is. You'd wonder why the wise men and the enchanters and such like couldn't interpret the dream. Is it because of the next bit, the warning? Maybe they didn't want to say, maybe they couldn't say because it's a message from the living God and it's kind of out of their league in that sense. But anyway, the, the, the tree is cut down, the branches are stripped off, the fruit scattered, the animals and the birds all flee. Just a stump left. It's tree roots left in the ground, bound with iron and bronze, remaining in the ground in the grass of the field, we're told. And then this voice from heaven about what is to happen to him, he'll be changed and uh, he's to live uh, a different way. You know, maybe that's why the astrologers and such like were reluctant to tell this to the king. How would they tell this to the king about what it meant? But anyway, Daniel comes in, and of course Daniel can interpret it, not because of Daniel, but as Daniel has told us before, because of his relationship with God. And he knows what it means, but it troubles Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar's to be cut down, if you like. The empire will change. Now, you might think, actually, on a surface reading, Daniel might be quite pleased with this. I mean, after all, Nebuchadnezzar is the one who subdued Jerusalem, who came against his own people, who trafficked Daniel and his friends away from his homeland back to, to Babylon. You might think, well, I'm, you know, this is quite good, actually. I'm quite pleased about this. The king's obviously going to be laid low if he doesn't change his ways. Think of what Nebuchadnezzar had done to Daniel. Think of what Nebuchadnezzar had done to his friends nearly all been killed. But no, actually, that's not the way Daniel feels about it. He, he's a person of faith and of deep faith in God, and he um, cares about uh, the people. And we've seen that before in Daniel. Uh, before when he was ordered to eat certain food, the official uh, was to give him certain food, but... Um, he said, no, actually, just give us vegetables for a while. But he says, I realize you might get into trouble. So he says, just, just see how we go with this. We're told that Daniel spoke to other officials with wisdom and with tact, that he saved others from being killed. He cares about people. And when he hears this dream, he says, then Daniel was greatly perplexed for a period of time and his thoughts terrified him. So the king says, don't hold it from me. Just tell me the meaning. And Belteshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. And he says, the tree you saw is you. Daniel really is troubled by this, by what's going to happen. He explains, O king, 
He says, you are that tree. In verse 22, you've become great and strong. Your greatness has grown. It reaches to the sky. Your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. But the messenger who says, cut it all down, just leaving the stump in the ground. Let him be drenched with dew. Let him live like a wild animal. He says, this is the interpretation. He says, you'll be driven away from people. You will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. You'll be drenched in the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdom of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. He says, but the stump and the roots in the ground means that your kingdom can be restored when you acknowledge that heaven rules. And he says, therefore, a king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. He says, change your ways. He says, the signs are there. This tree is you. He says, but please, he says, accept my advice. Renounce your sins. Do what's right. And renounce your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. Now's your opportunity to change. But how often do we hear of the right thing to do? How often do we hear God's voice in our life or have an opportunity and we don't take it? The Bible says today, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. It's today, don't put it off. Nebuchadnezzar knew what to do. He's he's being told, it's so clear. It's gripped him and he's had it clearly explained to him. He knew the decision he had to make. Daniel had told him, but Nebuchadnezzar, he put it off. He put it off, and the result it didn't go well for him. He hardened his heart to the message. But the Bible says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. That's exactly what happened. If the Lord is speaking to us, we are to respond and not put it off, but to renounce our old ways, where the old having gone and you having come were to come to God. And yet Nebuchadnezzar doesn't do it. And so we're told in verse 28, all this happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is this not the great Babylon I have built as a well residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? He says, twelve months later, a year later, maybe he thought it wasn't going to come to pass. Maybe he thought he got away with it. He's walking around on the roof of his palace, as kings would do. King David did that with too much time in his hands, got into his own kind of trouble. But here's Nebuchadnezzar strutting around on the palace roof in his own place, uh, surveying all of his grand things. And they were grand. Babylon, one of the wonders of the ancient world, amazing place. And here he is, Is this not the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty, he says. The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You are to be driven away until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes And we're told immediately what had been said about him was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. And obviously, tragically, Nebuchadnezzar appears to suffer what reads like some kind of breakdown, albeit with the language of the day, He's not washing or eating properly. His hair is overgrown. It says his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle, if you can imagine that. And his fingernails are uncut and unkept. His nails like the claws of a bird, if you can imagine him growing over and beginning to bend over his fingers. It's a a sad sight. And in in a way, you do feel for him. But the amazing thing is that mercifully, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter how far we've gone, the things that we've done in the past, we are never beyond the reach of God's grace. Even in the darkest of times, it doesn't matter how deep the pit we are in, 
how far away we feel from God and from others, God is there for us and his love and his grace and his mercy is there for us and it's there for anyone, even the undeserving. And he can bring us back and we can be restored. And that message of grace and that hope and that promise of grace was told to him. In his original dream, it was, but let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field. When Daniel interprets it, he says, the command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that, that heaven rules. There was hope, that stump remaining in the ground, that remnant, if you like, that's there. Nebuchadnezzar, in his particular case, needed to be humbled. And it happened in his life. There's always grace there and always hope, though. Even if you've put it off in the past, Nebuchadnezzar put things off. He'd obviously done things that were not right. I plead with you, renounce your sins by doing what's right. And he obviously didn't. But even now, even here in this place, in the pit that he was in, he could come to God. And God's arms are open to you too. No matter what's happened in the past or where you're coming from, God invites you to come to him, to come back to him today, not to put it off. His love is there for you now. In Revelation 3, it says, To those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. As he himself tells the story of what happened, he says, At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I raised my eyes towards heaven. My sanity was restored. I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Nebuchadnezzar writes, what an amazing end uh, to his story that we read off for now. He's been restored. And he says, I was restored and became even greater than before. And that's what happens to us when God's grace works in our life. I was restored and I can look back and say, I'm now even greater than I was before. And now I praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. May each of us know God in our life. May we come to God and may we glorify God and come to know him and worship him and know that all he does is right and all his ways are just. And that as the psalmist wrote, God heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Well, let us pray together. Oh Lord, you know our heart. You know where we are. Lord, you know our life and where we're at. You know what we've done in the journey we've been on. But Lord, we want to know you more in our life. We want to come to you. Help us not to put it off. If we know what to do, help us not to put it off for another day. Today, if you hear the Lord's voice, do not harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Help us to welcome you into every part of our life. To know that you are true and just and loving and a God of grace. Restore us, we pray that we might be even greater than we were before. And may all that be for your glory. Through Jesus. Amen.